I'm Joe Bianca. I'm Bill Finley. I'm Jonathan Green. I'm Alan Carrasso. They say the harder the work, the greater the reward. This is our life's work. Good morning. It is 9-13, Wednesday, November 18th. This is the TDN Writer's Room presented by Keeneland. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the Associate Editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. Hi, I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. Joe must be in heaven. The Jets didn't lose last weekend. That's right, they didn't play. (laughs) Jonathan Green, General Manager of DJ Stable. And Al, is it true that you refuse to uh, concede your spot on the podcast until the vote recount in Georgia is complete? There's no truth to that rumor, but that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Alan Carrasso, managing editor of the TDN. This is my last podcast. The Theo Epstein will be in this seat next week, and I'll be director of baseball operations for the Chicago Cubs. But on behalf of the maybe three Chicago Cup fans that, that uh, tune into the podcast, thanks, Theo. At long last, Al is finally getting his dream job. Happy for you, man. Um, and, and Bill, I am rooting for 0 16 at this point. So. I guess you have to be, right? Tank for yeah. Trevor. Of course. The TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Keeneland will conduct a December digital sale in the digital sales ring on Tuesday, December 15th. Entries are open between Monday, November 23rd and Friday, December 4th. Visit www.keenelanddigital for details. Okay, so very, very slow racing week. I warned you last week that this was going to happen. We're going to have some slow racing weeks coming up uh, between now and the spring, but we're, we're going we're gonna to find a way to keep it interesting. Actually, next couple weekends are, are really interesting. We've got the Clark weekend um, at Churchill on Thanksgiving weekend, and then after that, we got the Cigar Mile. So there will be a lot to talk about on the racetrack, but this week, not so much. So we thought it would be a good week to kind of run down the championship categories and see who's a lock and w- where there is still discussion to be had about who's going to end up taking on the Eclipse Awards in January. So we'll start from the top. I mean, Horse of the Year, I think, is, is pretty much a slam dunk with Authentic. I think there are some other cases that could be made, but I think the way he finished the year um, with the Derby and then the previous runner-up finish and the Classic, and then he has that other grade one win in the Haskell. Um, I think he's, he's pretty much a lock. Speak now or forever hold your peace, guys, on that one. Um, so we'll, we'll go down the line here. Older Dirt Mail. Um, I think improbable is is pretty much a lock as well. Um, he's got the three grade one wins. Nobody else has more than two. Um, older dirt female, Monomoy girl, once again. I think this was a category that Midnight Bizu kind of had a, a stranglehold on, but then she had to retire, and then and the Monomoy girl clinched it with, with the Breeders' Cup Classic victory. Uh, Trainer is an interesting one. I think, you know, the last couple of years, Chad Brown kind of had this in a stranglehold and it was, there was really no drama whatsoever. But I think this year, I think it's, there's a little bit of discussion to be had. I mean, Chad has obviously had another great year. I don't, I don't, I don't think you can call this necessarily a down year, even if it wasn't quite as dominant as he, as he was last year. Uh, but Brad Cox, who we had on the show last week, um, has just kind of, caught fire especially in the second half of the year and and um i wouldn't i wouldn't be surprised to see him take take the trophy as well i don't, steve, I don't think steve asmussen's impossible either he's had a really good year but i think it's probably going to come down to brad cox and, and and chad brown but i'm curious to hear what you guys think yeah that's a good point joe i think baffert will get some consideration as well i mean he only won the kentucky derby and the breeders cup classic two breeders cup wins but it's brad cox's year uh, i don't think chad brown's going to get it for a couple of reasons first of all you know, he had a very good year, but by the standards that he has set, he didn't do anything special. No Breeders' Cup wins, which was huge that he got skunked on the Breeders' Cup. You know, you don't expect him to be somebody who's going to be involved in the Triple Crown, but he wasn't again. And, and from the earnings race, um, I believe uh, that he's not in first place. I have to double check on that. Uh, I believe that Cox might have him beat. So, you know, this and also the other thing, I think voters get fatigued by voting for the same guy year after year. First it was Todd Pletcher, and then, you know, Baffert, uh, and then, of course, Chad Brown. They're looking for somebody new and different. And the four Breeders' Cup wins, I mean, that's the kind of, like, wow moment where you say, okay, this is something the guy did that was very special. Uh, he'll have two champions, the Monomoy girl and the two-year-old male champion. So I'm not saying it's a slam dunk, but I'd be surprised if Brad Cox does not get it. Yeah, I think this year is definitely a horse race when it comes to the, the trainers. And and we've mentioned four already, and there's only going to be three on the ballot. So somebody's going to be, you know, left off right from the get-go. 
Um, you know, everyone is always looking for the new shiny, fun, um, you know, freshman sire or new, you know, equipment, uh, you know, what have you. So I think that's why, you know, some of the voters are going to look to a, a Brad Cox and say, OK, here's the newer guy on the on the horizon that's going to uh, be an up is an up and coming trainer and needs to be recognized. Um, but, you know, Bill, I agree with your sentiment that, that you have to look at Baffert again and say, OK, the guy had a 30 percent win percentage this year, 65 percent win place in show um, and uh, and and won you know, many of the signature races of, of the year, um, including, you know, having a horse that's going to that won the, the classic and is going to be horse of the year. So, you know, I would like to see, you know, people kind of look back and say, OK, if we took the names off of everyone's resume, um, who would have the best year? Uh, and, and this is going to be one of the tightest races, I think, that they've had in, uh, in, in the past couple of years. Hey, I want to jump in before Alan goes real quick. And one thing about Baffert that was left unmentioned and shouldn't be, will people not vote for him because of the drug positives that he's right. had this year? And again, you know, we don't think this is Navarro and Sturgis. We can't say that enough times. But, you know, he has been in the news for a lot of wrong reasons this year. Uh, I think that will discourage voters. I mean, not much to add. I mean, it's interesting to look at the stats um, and see if Brad Cox has had basically a third of the, of the runners that Asmussen has and is right on nipping at his heels in terms of earnings. But I'm with you, Bill. I think um, – you send out four Breeders' Cup winners on a single weekend. I, th I think that's sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back. I mean, I'll, I'll be within the context of 14 Breeders' Cup races, um, but just the second trainer to do that in one Breeders' Cup, um, Richard Mandela did there at San Diego when there were only seven or eight races at the time. But um, yeah, I, I think it's Brad Cox's year and, and he's done it. You know, he's got a, um, a mix of stock. I mean, he's got, the Godolphins and Judmonts of the world, but then he's got, you know, Monomoy Girl, who they who they didn't pay all that much money for, who's become, uh, who he's managed through a Hall of Fame career. So, um, but yeah, I, I don't know if, you know, if Chad Brown had done enough to earn it, I, I'd cast a vote for him. There's no, uh, there's no reason I, I wouldn't, but but I, I'm, I'm with you guys. I think, I think this is Brad's year. Am I the only one here without an eclipse vote, or does John not have one either? I don't have an eclipse vote either yet. Not yet. I'm working on it, though. All right. I didn't want to feel left out there. Um, no, I'll, accept, I'll accept input from you guys. How about that? All right, cool. I'll, I'll lobby you. Uh, but just some quick stats. Is, uh, on, the, on, the, on stakes wins, Steve Asmussen leads the way with 46, but I think that's uh, – not, that not that he hasn't had a good year, but I think that's also a function of volume because he has so many horses all across the country – um, Chad has has 42. Brad Cox has 39. Next closest one is uh, our, our Bob Baffert and Mike Maker with with 32. And we talked last week about the graded stakes wins. Uh, Brad Cox overtook Chad Brown with the Breeders' Cup. Um, he had 20. He has 28, um, and then Chad has 27, and then and Bob Baffert has 25. Uh, nobody else has more than 16. Asmussen is next with 16. Um, but just going down the list, Jockey, I think uh, Irad is, is going to win again. Um, I just don't think anyone else has had a, a really standout year. We've got some some good performances. Flavian Pratt has had another great year um, in California. Uh, Jose Ortiz has had a pretty good, pretty good year as well. But it just it's kind of I rides world, and we're all living in it right now in terms of the jockey race. Uh, two year old male Central Quality is going to win it. I think um, uh, Jackie's Warrior is going to get a couple of votes, but I, I, I think Central Quality the 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 way he dominated in the Breeders Cup is going to slam that door. Uh, two-year-old Philly. I guess Vequist is going to win it as well. I mean, you do have Princess Nora, who has multiple grade one wins, but did not get it done in, in the Breeders' Cup, and, and so much relies on that. Uh, three-year-old Philly, slam dunk. I think that's the biggest lock of the of the entire uh, season. Although, I don't know, Gamine might get some might get some votes as well, but I think Swiss Skydiver, because she stepped outside of the box and won the Preakness, is, is going to get that pretty handily. Uh, three-year-old male, obviously authentic. We didn't see that. We didn't necessarily see that coming two months ago, but he went and, and got it out from under, under Tis the Law. Uh, sprinter is an interesting one. There wasn't anybody who really had a standout year sprinting. It wasn't like last year where Matoli had this brilliant campaign and was essentially a, a, uh, a slam dunk um, sprinter champion. I was looking at the voting from last year. Somehow he wasn't uh, a unanimous champion sprinter maximum security got five votes 
I feel like he only won one sprint race, really. That bold, was, the like, bold ruler, right? Yeah, I mean, I, maybe there, maybe some people were counting the cigar mile. Anyway, um, I'm curious to hear what you guys think because Vacoma looked like he was on his way to that. He had the Carter win. Um, if you want to count the Met Mile as a sprint, he had that win, but then he just the wheels kind of fell off of him later in the in the year. He wasn't able to get back to the races after the after the Met Mile. Um, I'm wondering what Bill thinks because I, I feel like he has an opinion on this. Yeah, my opinion is that I have no opinion. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a couple of divisions, and we'll get to them late, uh, a couple of these other later. These are real head scratchers. And frankly, I don't think anybody deserves it, but you have to vote for somebody. And I think right now it's probably going to come down to Vacoma or Whitmore. So Vacoma's play race three times all year. And also, what do you do with the Met Mile? I do not consider that a sprint. Some people say it's around one turn, it's a sprint. To me, a mile race is not a sprint period. So then are you going to give a horse the title based on a car, the win in the Carter and the Sir Shackleton? Uh, Whitmore, the problem with him is he's only three for seven on the year. The only other graded stakes he won besides the Breeders' Cup sprint was the Count Fleet. Maybe if Nashville wins the Malibu, would some people you know, reach out to him? He, that would give him a grade one win uh, right at the end of the year. Um, I think if it were to close today, I would vote for Whitmore and kind of just uh, – even though I've, I've given you a lot of reasons not to vote for him, maybe just on the he's cool effect um, in a year where, you know, nobody stands out, uh, you know, Whitmore would be my choice. But, you know, this is uh, this is a real difficult category and uh, we're not going to get a, another Matoli out of it this year. Nothing close. No. And, and I'll throw two names out there also. And, and you know, to me right now, if you, if you said who is the best sprinter in the country, it's Nashville. Now, he doesn't have the credentials. Um, in the sense of graded victories or anything like that. But he is the best sprinter right now. He's the best sprinter based on sheet numbers, the best sprinter based on time, the best sprinter based on buyers. And and on the eye test, he's the best sprinter in the country. Um, you know, when he won the Perryville on uh, on Breeders' Cup weekend, he did it in new track record 107 and four, which is almost a full second faster than Whitmore did to win the sprint um, later on in the afternoon. The track bias didn't change that much in a couple hours. Um, the other one that I'll throw out there, and I know I'm going to get an eye roll from Bill, is Gamine. She won the test, which is seven eighths, you know, got grade one, um, one by seven furlongs. Again, if we're going to make the argument that a one turn mile is a sprint, she won the Acorn, which is a grade one by 19 lengths. And then she won the Breeders' Cup Philly Mare Sprint um, against older fillies by six lengths, um, going seven eighths in a new track record of 107 and four, which ironically enough was the same winning time as Nashville. So I know what you're saying. They have their own category and that's fine, but there are times where top horses do cross over into other divisions um, and sweep those kind of, uh, you know, uh, awards um, during the night. The real third party candidate nobody has mentioned is volatile and pound for pound for me, even though his campaign was abbreviated pound for pound for me, he was the fastest, on figures, fastest and most dominating sprinter that was on the track this year. And I'm 99% sure that's who's getting my vote. Yeah, no. I, Cue the eye roll. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, no, that, that's legit. No, I mean, his, his, his race in the Vanderbilt was pretty damn good. And he had that big win before that. To Bill's point about, about Whitmore, I think it might be kind of a lifetime achievement award for, award for him. Even if he wasn't the pound for pound best sprinter this year, I think a lot of people like him and, and admire him. And, and with good reason, I think he's going to get a lot of votes, sentiment, sent, sentimentality votes um, for champion sprinter. I'm just wondering out loud, um, horses like Authentic and... I mean, less likely for Swiss Skydiver because I do think Gamine's going to take some votes from her. But is Authentic a unanimous three-year-old choice? I would think so, Alan. I mean, who else could you go back to to Tis the Law? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose somebody could make an yeah. argument for, for Tis the Law. But, yeah, but he um, beat him fair and square in the Breeders' Cup. Absolutely. absolutely. You know, um, will he get 100% of the votes? Maybe not. He get, should get 98, you know. Uh, okay, let's do, let's, do, let's do turf horses. Turf female, I think is another interesting one. I, I think similar to Whitmore, I think rushing ball, even if she didn't have a dominant campaign is going to win um, for nothing else, because she's, she's been so good for so long, four straight years with grade one victory. She did win the Jenny Wiley. Um, she also won the, the, the uh, Diana and then was a close second in, in the Philly and Mary turf, but Bill, do you, can you make a case for anybody else? Well, the only horse you can make a case for besides her is Carnawa, and I, I think she'll get a lot of votes. I mean, you know, pretty big accomplishment of Philly beating boys in the Breeders' Cup turf. I have never voted for these one and done European horses, and and it kind of like, uh, you know, kind of upsets me when people do. One thing I would be adamant about: I don't think anything they accomplished 
overseas should count whatsoever. This has nothing to do with what horse might have done in Ireland or, or, or Europe, whatnot. I'm with you, Joe. Uh, you know, Rushing Fall is not the greatest candidate, but she did win the two grade ones, and she ran well enough. She was second in the Breeders' Cup affiliate mayor of turf. Tarna was the only other one that will garner consideration. I'll go with Rushing Fall, and I think the voters will go. Can you make a case also for Starship Jubilee? Um, because she didn't actually lose the race. I mean, you know, she she threw the rider um, and didn't actually, you know, finish the race in, in the Breeders' Cup uh, a turf race. But in the meantime, she was, if you don't count that race, she was five of six uh, this year, and she beat the boys in the grade one Woodbine Mile. Um, so for me, there's, and again, in a Lifetime Achievement Award um, sense, that would be a horse that I would, uh, you know, say, kind of grinded it out and and you could give the you can give a couple of votes to her as well um she wasn't uh you know explosive like some of the other horses but she danced every dance that that, that she was in and uh and and just has a great story and and you know ran almost 40 times in her career and won 20 of them so one more category um that is is kind of up for grabs i think uh is is turf male um, last year, of course, this was a, this was a slam dunk, unanimous, no brainer with bricks and mortar winning horse of the year. He got every single vote for, for champion turf male, uh, channel maker had a pretty good year. He had a couple grade one wins. Um, but I just, I don't know. There was nobody that really, really jumped off the page at me, you know, to, to win this award. Uh, what, what do you guys think? Anybody you want to make a case for? Yeah, Joe, this one is, this is the the real mess of the messes in here. You think that uh, Sprinter and Turf Philly w- was uh, a problem. I mean, good luck. What do you do here? You're right, Channel Maker, but he was had a good year, but he was two for eight. Uh, do you give a Clips Award to a horse that was two for eight? I don't know. United had his moment in the Suns. Uh, he didn't win a single grade one race all year. I'll go back uh, to earlier in the year. Zulu Alpha won the Pegasus World Cup Turf, won grade one, won a couple grade twos. Um, I have no idea who to vote for here. And uh, whoever you, anybody votes for is going to be at one of the weakest Eclipse Award winners ever. That's no other way to put it. Yeah. Do you, do you make a case for a horse like Halliday, who won the four-star Dave at Saratoga? Um, and then really, unfortunately, kind of laid an egg in the in the Breeders' Cup it, itself. But before that, you know, he won the four-star Dave. He won the very famous um, Sunshine Forever $75,000 added stake at Gulfstream. Uh, he won an allowance race. And then uh, he did win the... Uh, the Tropical uh, Derby, um, which again was a seventy-five thousand dollars added stake. It, it's it's just a it's a tough. You almost have to backdoor into this uh, into this award. It, it is not a great group resume wise. There's some great horses that that campaigned, um, but they just kind of knocked each other off, and and nobody really emerged as what you would say would be a definitive champion. Yeah, I'm I'm pleading the fifth right now. I have no idea which direction. I mean. Like as inconsistent as they were in the turf marathons, it has me looking and thinking about turf milers, but there was no dominant turf miler either. I mean, you know, Raging Bull won a race and, and Halliday won a race, but like nobody took the ball and ran with it. And then even like, was there a dominant male turf sprinter? But then there was nothing that there. Uh, glass Slippers won the won the the turf sprint, so. I'll open the PPs and I guess we need to pick some, we need to pick three finalists. Good. Yikes. <laughs> um, I, I would, I would, I would vote for channel maker if I had a vote just because again, like he's, you know, he's stuck around. He's won a lot. He's won a lot of big races. He's not the most consistent story. And he did run pretty well in the, in the turf. Obviously it was a slow pace that he was on, but to just get beat like a little bit of a nose by magical, I think is an accomplishment um, in itself. But yeah, I mean, you, if you go back through some of the other winners, it doesn't necessarily have to be a turf router, like, or a turf marathoner. I mean, Rick's and more, more than one last year, but before that you had Stormy Liberal, who was a turf sprinter. Before that you had World Approval, who was a miler. And we just, you know, the, the Aiden O'Brien horse is coming and running one, two, three in the Breeders' Cup mile did not really reflect well on our, our domestic milers here. But yeah, I mean, just who, who do you even grab? But for me, I would lean towards Channel Maker. But yeah, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to be the most star-studded class of finalists for sure. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. They say, the harder the work, the greater the reward. And this is hard work. It's the hours put in before dawn and after dark. It's the sacrifice, the sweat, the failure, and the faith. This is our industry. 
This is our life's work. Owning multiple graded stakes winning racehorses like Hard Not to Love and Decorated Invader is attainable with a racing partnership like West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtb.com. All right, so we had a little bit of news on the Jason Service, Jorge Navarro, FBI indictments front yesterday. T.D. Thornton reported on it in today's TDN. There was a court hearing yesterday. Um, Bill knows more about this than any of us, so I'm, I'm going to toss it to him for the bullet points. Yeah, I mean, here are the bullet points out of uh, T.D.'s story. Uh, first of all, the government said, and it's not something they haven't said before, but kind of with more force, I think, than any other time that there's possibility that there'll be new charges for the people that have already been indicted. And we already saw that happen with the mail fraud uh, charge attached to service in, in the superseding indictment. And there's a possibility that new people could be indicted, which everybody has been thinking all along, you know, especially with apparently some of the people that were indicted, maybe now singing to the government, who else is going to get thrown uh, thrown into this? So we have no names or anything, but that possibility did come up. Another thing that was interesting in this, they brought up the idea that maybe some of this stuff that the guys were selling to service was snake oil. That they were just saying, oh, uh, use the red devil and it's going to be uh, move your horses up by 10 lengths. And it was just nonsense. They just kind of duped service in, into using this stuff. Now, I, I think maybe one of the reasons they're doing that is not necessarily that these drugs were uh, not performance enhancers. But if the, the defense wanted to bring up, say, oh, we've done all studies on SGF 1000, and it doesn't help horses one bit, the government is saying it doesn't matter. You, you use it under the pretense that you thought you were moving a horse up. And then just more um, dates thrown out there. It looks like this thing has the possibility of dragging on forever. I mean, they're talking about still uh, deliberating stuff in May of next year. Um, you know, I, I still think the same thing I thought right from the start. This will end when the people who are indicted enter guilty pleas. I don't think this is going to come to trial. Uh, usually these things don't. They enter a guilty plea. They get a reduced sentence from what's in the indictments. But if not, I mean, they're talking about millions of pieces of evidence. It, it, we could be talking about this five years from now. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 kind of the frustrating part is I think a lot of us really want like, what do we want? Justice. When do we want it? Now. And I just, it doesn't, it doesn't seem like that's, that's going to happen in this case. You know, there's, like I said, there's this little, this little drip drip of, of information every now and then um, at, at the end of the, of the story, it says a second round of motions dealing only with defense requests to suppress evidence or expert testimony now is a May 24th target deadline, but a status hearing scheduled 10 days before then will determine if that's a realistic date. <laughs> says at this point, it's premature to even consider a pretrial schedule um, that extends beyond the time frame of next spring. Now, obviously, this was affected somewhat by the by the virus at first, but I think people have adjusted so much with with virtual court hearings that I think that 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 can't be used as a reason. This is just the the slow grinding gears of our of our justice system, and that's kind of what what's taking so long here. And it's it's unfortunate because I think you know there was there was a lot of momentum in racing when this first dropped to like get rid of the cheaters and all this stuff. And I think that there's that some of that has has sustained, but I think, you know, a, a quicker resolution to this, I think would, would have, you know, a, a greater impact in terms of, of PR and how racing reacts. But, you know, it does seem like more people might be talking as well. Um, it's not just the two people who pleaded guilty. There were five people who were not in the superseding indictment. So that would suggest, I'm just a, a, a novice here on this stuff, but that, that would suggest to me that there are more people cooperating. Um, the, the interesting thing that Bill brought up about uh, how even if the drugs didn't work, they're going to be charged with the same thing is is pretty wild because, you know, they they have pr that means to me that they have proven the intent here, at least in their mind, they, they, they're they proven the intent. Um, so that's I know that's kind of you, you played yourself a little bit. If you got drugs that don't, didn't even work and then you're going to you're going you're gonna to go to jail over it. I mean, I don't know about that one. But, uh, you know, I think it, one of the interesting quotes was. Um, Horse owners are among the primary or, in or intended victims. Race tracks, racing commissions, owners, other competitors. A lot of a lot a lot of people that were affected by this were listed, and because I think the question was, how did this really affect other people? But one one group of people that they didn't mention was the betters, and I think betters have been defrauded, you know, if not just as much as everyone, but 
than close because you know they're the people they're the engine that keeps the game going and you know we were we were screwed over by this as well so i would like to see a little bit more focus on that but um those are just a, a couple of my thoughts i'm wondering if, if john or al have, have anything on this now i think that, that the government is really taking their time because they want to make sure that they have all their i's dotted and t's crossed um, and we've talked about this in the past about their conviction rate um, and it's astronomical. It's in the, the mid 90 percentile. So basically, they're not going to you know, even get this far unless they know they have all the evidence that they need to, to lock these people up. Um, I actually take it as much as I would love for things to be done quicker. I'm actually taking it as a positive thing that they are deliberating and taking their time um, because I really think that they're putting the squeeze on these individuals who were indicted. And if we're going to try to clean up the industry um, you know, across the board, then you need information from people who allegedly were cheating and what practices and, and procedures they implemented in order to get past the tests. And then also who else was involved. Um, so that way, you know, once this machine starts rolling, um, it can pick up steam and, and hopefully pick off other people who were equally as guilty or doing things that were outside of the rules, um, you know, of, of the establishment. So, you know, we all want this to be done yesterday. We all wanted it to, you know, to clean up the sport immediately. Um, but I'm going to hold out hope that because they're deliberating and taking so much time in going through all this, um, that they have, you know, these 27 people locked down and it's just going to beget other people. Um, and hopefully the list will get longer and the industry will get stronger because of all this. Yeah, I agree, John. It, it, you know, in a sense, it doesn't really matter how long it takes. Um, I think I saw something that the discovery, like you were saying, Joe, we'll take a look at May 24th and 10 days before that, we'll decide if that's realistic. I mean, it sounds based on the literal mountain of discovery that there is, that's going to take them that long to sift through all, all the uh, evidence and, and tapes and documents and everything. But, you know, at the end of the day, if they, if they're focused on getting it right, um, who cares if it takes six months or six years? Let's just get it right and and send the message. Yeah, I mean, obviously the justice system has has to work its way um, through this. I'm just I'm thinking more in terms of the the momentum within the industry. I think that that's kind of been blunted a little bit by how long this is taking. But yeah, I mean, there's that's why that's why lawyers bill by the hour because there's there's nine million things that have to be done before we we get to any kind of result. Um, but just to to put a bow on it, I think the 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 main thing was that Andrew Adams, who's the United States uh, attorney, uh, is who I was quoting before when I was talking about who they said that the, the scheme affected. Um, he said there may well be other crimes as to the particular defendants in this case, and the government is continuing to look at other people who are not currently charged. And I think that's the, that's the thing that we're, we're kind of keeping our ears open for, even if there's not a, a verdict for a while, we're looking for additional indictments. We're looking for additional people that that can be swept up in this because, as we've said over and over again, this is not this is far from the the end of the line in terms of people who we think are cheating um, in the industry. And it's you know you could you could do a sweep of pretty much every racing jurisdiction in this country and find some cheaters. So I think that's kind of that's kind of what we're waiting for, and that'll that'll sustain us until we actually get a final result about this. But um, Bill, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think you're right about that. If you look at the you know, what's going on here? How could there not be new people indicted? Now, I, I don't know for a fact there's going to be, but you have the drug suppliers. Some of them now, their names have dropped off the list of people being indicted or the people have uh, the two individuals that pled guilty earlier to, uh, you know, much reduced charges or they, they dropped some of the charges against them. You would, you know, we don't know for sure, but it would stand to reason that they are cooperating. So I'm Joe Drug Supplier. I've got records of who I sold this stuff to. And, you know, I can name names from here to the next Tuesday. So, you know, I think if you're somebody that was doing business with these guys, you ought to be running real scared right now. So, you know, I think that's where this is all headed, but it is taking its time. I think Alan made a lot of sense, though. Um, if it takes six months or six years, you know, the important thing is to get it right and, and to get some, uh, you know, real justice done for uh, the people that deserve to spend time in prison. And these guys do deserve to spend time in prison, no doubt about it. Yeah, and, you know, I think that's that sounds right. That the uh, the manufacturers, the people who don't who don't really have name recognition, I think it behooves the government and and the U.S. Attorney's Office to kind of get those people to you know give up the people who do have more name recognition 
Um, I think that, that that would have more of a longstanding effect in the industry if we can have more big names like Service and Navarro who, who are involved in this. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses and stakes action for a fraction of the cost of trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtv.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. So while it wasn't a big racing weekend, there were a couple of performances I just wanted to mention real quick. Uh, this is, I feel like this is the time of the year where we start to look towards the Derby. Um, we, we had about 11 months last year to look towards the Derby. Hopefully this year we don't have quite as interminable a wait. Um, so the, the, uh, we had two rising stars on Sunday and then a couple of stakes as well. Del Mar had, had stakes in the Bob Hope and the Desi Arnaz. Um, Philly name Astute won the, the Desi Arnaz. Very impressive for LNJ Foxwood. It's got an 87 buyer and uh, red flag for Tamar Cruz was Tamar Cruz's first uh, stakes winner in the Bobo. This horse had run on turf last time and won by six and a half lengths. Obviously, wasn't a, the greatest field of all time. We got an 80 buyer, um, but looked looked like the future is on dirt for him. Um, as well, the Bob Hope is, is an interesting race. I think might get upgraded um, in the future, even though this year's renewal wasn't too sharp. I think you've got a lot of really good horses run there in the past. Um, but I wanted to talk about the rising stars. And if you go on the TDN website right now, you can see um, in our featured video or featured race replays box, um, you can see both of them. There's uh, Aqueduct's fourth race on Sunday, which is a filly named Harper's in Charge by Malibu Moon. And then Churchill's eighth race on Sunday, a colt named Caddo River um, by Hardspun. And they, they kind of won in two different ways. They both went to the lead, but Harper's in Charge had this just easy, easy win. It was just never asked for anything at any point. It kind of reminded me of a Princess Nora when she, when she broke her maiden. Now we'll see if Harper's in Charge can go forward. Princess Nora hasn't quite yet, um, but she was just, and she got bet too. She was like six to five or seven to five throughout um, in a field that, you know, had a, had a couple established barns in there. So it wasn't as if there was, there was nothing to bet, but for Christophe Clement, the horse just was bet like she couldn't lose and ran like she couldn't lose, just popped right out for the front and just, you know, was really never asked for anything. And then Cattle River was a horse who was making his third start. Harper's in charge made her debut. Cattle River made his third start at TDM. We try not to generally make horses who have started a bunch as TDM rising stars, but this was one that I, I couldn't help because, um, in his second start, last out, he was on a super, super fast pace in a really live looking maiden race. I don't know if you guys know, but a horse named Speaker's Corner for Bill Mott and Godolphin won. And he looks like a pretty good horse. I think there's a couple horses out of there. That'll be that'll be nice. But the Cattle River ran by far the best race of any of them. He was just he was on that blazing pace, 22 and 44 and change um, and ended up just getting nailed late for a second. I think it was beaten three quarters of a length and then went back to his home base at Churchill for Brad Cox on Sunday. and. and uh, was bet hard, wasn't the greatest field of all time, but just popped out of the front and w was blazing. 22.38, 44.59 going a mile and just widened with every step in the stretch, one by nine and a half lengths. Um, so I think those two are, are, are horses to look for in the future. Cattle River, I think, because of how fast he is, might be a little better going shorter ultimately. I'm going to guess is they'll stretch him out in a race maybe like the Lecompte at Fairgrounds. Um, so we'll, we'll see what his future ends up being. But I just he's so fast and, and, and super talented. And Harper's in charge is, who knows? Like, who knows how good she is? Like I said, she wasn't really asked for anything um, in Sunday's race. But the way she was bet and the way she won, my guess is a graded stakes win is in her future. Um, Al, did you have, have any thoughts about these races or any of the two-year-old action? I thought uh, I thought Red Flag was was pretty impressive. I, I admit to completely over overlooking him uh, when I was looking at the race. But you know, it's interesting with these um, with these young sire sons of Spitestown and Spitestown himself. Was like Spitestown can get you anything at any distance on any surface, um, dirt, turf, short, long, synthetic. I mean, he's he's really been an incredible stallion and. And Tamara Cruz is another one, I mean, obviously a, a Breeders' Cup dirt mile winner. But, I mean, you could see 
his progeny taking to, to the turf as well. But this one was coming off the turf and on, onto the main track. and didn't have the easiest trip, sat out there uh, four wide, uh, no cover, facing the breeze, and and just kicked the kicked away powerfully and and, and won um, looking like a, a, a real – like he's got a real home on, on dirt. So um, – but it's interesting, so that victory made seven freshman sires of this class that have been represented by at least one rated stakes winner, and that list includes Nyquist, Not This Time, Laban, Brody's Cause, Hit It A Bomb, Texas Red, and, and Tamar Coos. Two of those uh, are Spencer signs. Um, and last year's class, um, first crop was uh, included Constitution and American Pharaoh, and that, that class was represented by six stallions, um, who had graded stakes winners. So that's a feather in the cap for, for this class. Although last year's class had more uh, first crop sires with black type winners, 26, than this one does with uh, with 19. But um, I think it's, you know, it's promising. I always like looking at the, at the freshman sires and, and projecting what they might do um, going forward. So um, just wanted to throw in that little tidbit. Now you can make the case that that it was harder this year to get black type as a two year old just because of all the stopping and starting of of training and and a lot of races that got canceled that got pushed off, um, which meant you know bigger fields. So it, you know it, it really was a feather in the cap of this year's group of freshman sires to get to have it spread out amongst a, a number of different uh, you know show show horses. Right, and right there on our website, right near the Rising Stars link is. Uh, TD Insider stats. So have a look at those if you get a chance. Sponsored by Darley. Don't forget that. Sponsored by Darley. Um, but yeah, no, it's that's, that's that's a great resource as well, and and good info for, from Al. I thought. I mean, we, we touched on this a little bit, but I think last year's freshman class was so so ballyhooed um, that this year's freshman class didn't quite get the same amount of hype. But it's proven to be pretty damn good, and you know, not this time at Nyquist or, or at the top of that. But there's plenty of high quality first crop sires in there, Lauban, Outworks, Spitester. I mean, there's there's definitely some 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 sires that can, I think, prove themselves as, as kind of foundational sires going forward. The New York Racetrack Chaplaincy's Christmas Drive is underway. The Racetrack Chaplaincy does great work in the Belmont Ax- Aqueduct backstretch communities. Learn about why you should consider sponsoring a family this Christmas. In my time around the backstretch, it's been apparent to me that the backstretch chaplaincy is really part of the backbone of the racetrack and what they do for people, the care, there are no bounds, no limits to what they will do for the people of the backstretch in terms of improving their quality of life. And I fully intend to support their Christmas charity and their pledge and to support a family. Since you mentioned the backstretch community and chaplaincy, um, one organization that, that actually works with the uh, New York chaplaincy is the NYTHA board, the New York Thoroughbred Horsemen's Association. Um, and their their primary goal is for the betterment of, of the racetrack, for the animals, the athletes, and the people who are on the backstretch. Um, and I'm pleased to announce that I'm gonna be running for one of the NYTHA board positions. Um, so the ballots have gone out and the uh, the election uh, is gonna be on December 7th. So um, I'd appreciate anyone's support with regard to my candidacy for for NYTHA. Um, It's just a wonderful board. Even if you don't vote for me, please give money and time and your energies to that worthy cause. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So our Green Group Guest of the Week this week is the general manager of Spendthrift Farm, Ned Toffee. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. So good to have you. I mean, Spendthrift has been in the news, obviously, a lot. But I wanted to start by asking about the big horse. And I just don't remember. I don't go back as far as in racing as some of these other guys on the panel. But I just don't remember a stallion farm that has been so re- so rejuvenated and has had such growth because of one stallion. Into Mischief has just been an incredible boon for Spendthrift, and now you guys just seem to be expanding all the time. Can you talk a little bit about what Into Mischief has meant to Spendthrift as a business? Yeah, I mean, you know, horses like that just don't come along very often, and and uh, we realize how fortunate we are to have him. Uh, um, you know, years ago, 2004, when Mr. Hughes bought the farm, uh, the stallion complex here was something that was always on his mind. Um, by that time, he already had Malibu Moon, 
uh, once we did some renovations here at Spendthrift, we brought Malibu Moon over and we really thought that was our, our flagship horse. And um, all the while there was this, uh, this uh, little um, uh, son of Harlan's holiday. Uh, we bought at a uh, two-year-old in training sale really for $180,000, which may sound like a lot of money, but in, in the grand scheme of things and, and relative to a lot of the horses that we buy, it's really not. Um, you know, the first year he was here, he was he was a tough sell. First couple of years he was here, he was a very tough sell. But um, he's just taken off. And I think, you know, one of the programs that we did, the Share the Upside program, was actually designed to help sell seasons uh, and into mischief. And into mischief, it, it really sort of it turned, turned around to be the opposite. Into mischief sort of made the program. Um, he gave that program and some of the other programs that, that Mr. Hughes has come up with over the years, gave those credibility and he gave us credibility in, in addition to Malibu Moon. So he was just a great next step. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be fortunate if we can ever have another one as good as him, but you know, he, he has, he's done so much. He drives traffic to the farm. It, it gives you credibility when you go to stand other stallions. Um, you know, people give us a lot of credit for having you know, quote unquote, made into mischief. Um, we're, we're happy to take that credit, but I think the credit goes to into mischief. Um, all you can really do is give these horses, get mares to them, give them an opportunity and, and it's up to the horse and, and into mischief is just, he's been incredible that way for us. So uh, again, but it's, it's given us the confidence to go out and to start to go after other, some other really top horses. And over the years, we've tried to try to build the stallion roster and, uh, you know, last year we were very fortunate to, to have some great additions, um, and right up to this year with with uh, Authentic and Bacoma. So, hey, Ned, it's Bill Finley, and thanks for joining us. And, and switching gears to another horse that's been very much in the news with Spencer with his Monomoy Girl. Of course, we all know you guys bought her at the Phasic Tip in November sale and quickly announced plans to uh, run her in 2021. And I know it's a little bit early in the game, but everybody's dying to know what races you're, you're looking at. And uh, I asked Brad Cox the same question. We had him on last week. You know, what about the possibility of perhaps facing males? What about the possibility of races like Dubai, Saudi Arabia? So, again, I apologize for asking you maybe a little bit before you guys have formulated plans, but everybody's dying to know. So any hints you can give us would be much appreciated. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have any bombshell for you. Um, I will say this, you know, overseas, you see Phillies run against Colts much more often. So that's not something we would we would be afraid to do. And obviously, we have a little of experience with that. This year's Kentucky or uh, uh, Preakness Stakes. So, um, you know, I'm not we, we wouldn't be afraid to run her against the boys at all. I think the goal at the end of the year would be the Breeders' Cup. We'd like to wind back that wind up back there. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of uncertainty with the with the big races overseas. Certainly those purses are are enticing, but um, you know, with COVID sort of amping back up, the the uncertainty um of whether or not those races will even be run. Um creates a lot of questions there. I, I think it'd be really nice to just have a, a, a great uh, local uh, uh, campaign with her and, and wind up back up at, at, at the Breeders' Cup. And that's really about all. Right now, you know, Brad is just um, uh, sort of assessing her. In my last conversation, he was, he was thrilled with the way that she's moving, said she's, she's doing as well as she's ever done. Um, so, uh, fingers crossed, we look forward to a, to, to a big year from her, but, um, I, I would think nothing set in stone, but a good chance that she stays, stays here and, uh, and goes to the Breeders' Cup at the end of the year. Ned, I actually have two, two questions for you. One also about Mono My Girl. Was there a dollar amount in your mind or in Mr. Hughes's mind where you said, that's too much because nine and a half million dollars is a ton of money for, for a race filly. Uh, were, were you guys beyond your budget or was 10 million your budget? Well, well, we put, we, we put down a number and the number we had down in, in, uh, in our catalogs was, was 10 million. We thought that it was going to take 10 million to get her. So, so, you know, see, we, we saved half a million. We're in good shape. So. There you go. There you go. And, um, and, 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 you know, and an auction is, a, a, can be a little bit of an emotional thing. So that, you know, you, you write down a number and you're, you're not tied to it, or you may even, you, you may even fall short of it, but that was, that was the number we had down. Right. Now that, that, that's great. That's great insight because, you know, you sit there and you, you get the emotion 
of you know of the sale and that's one of the one of the exciting parts of the sales you get that adrenaline rush when your horse is in the ring and and then it's mano a mano against whoever you're bidding against and sometimes you lose sight of the value of the horse so i appreciate your honesty on on that one um my second question about about the uh, the fillies that you were buying so you guys bought no less than seven fillies and mares um at a million and a half dollars or more when did you start that process of saying, okay, we're going to start accumulating some of the top race fillies, um, you know, that are in the country to, to I'm assuming, breed to your stallions? Mm-hmm. I think it was it, just this fall, as we talked about our plans, every, you know, every fall we sort of start to formulate what we're going to do going into the next breeding season, uh, what stallions we're going to use. Uh, we do breed mostly in-house. We've we've spread out a little bit in, in the last year or so. Um but we wanted to have some really marquee type mares uh, to use for into mischief, authentic, and and even some of the stands that were were in here uh, came in last year as well. Um, you know, we we feel like we have a very strong broodmare band. Um, about had about prior to the sale had about uh, eighty five mares um, sold a handful in November and obviously added some. Um, but we wanted to have some of those marquee type mares. Um, and we felt like that we we generally will move our own mares out of the way if we have clients that really need to get their mares bred. So oftentimes some of the mares that we start out planning to breed to some of these stallions um, end up getting bred to somebody else. This year, what we wanted to do was have some mares that we just felt were really strong. Uh, we may not breed a lot to, to into mischief. Mr. Us- usually likes to, um, uh, collect the stud fee and, and and make room for our for our clients. Um, we've got a handful of mares that that will will certainly need to go to into mischief, authentic, and, and and the likes of those. Hey Ned, Alan Carrasso, how are you? Good. How are you, Alan? I'm well. Thanks. Thanks very much. You know, tracing back um, into mischief's family, obviously son of uh, Harlan's holiday, grandson of Harlan, and and great grandson of Storm Cat on top. Um, you know, Harlan hadn't done a whole lot at the time, the sire of uh, horses like Menifee, but what what is it about Into Mischief? What does he pass on to his progeny, any intangibles that just make them the extra special specimens that they've ended up being? Yeah, that's that's a great question. And, and, and I think that, you know, what I would really like to know is why or how. Uh, that's that's the question that confounds everybody. If we would know this going in, we'd know exactly which ones to buy um, or breed to. Um, but I think some of the things that really impressed me about, about Into Mischief is, one, he's a very intelligent horse. Uh, and he's a great-minded horse. He's he's easy going. I remember Richard uh, talking about him when uh, when he sent him to us from the track, and he said, "You know, you'll think he's sort of uh, a tough guy. He'll sort of bellow, and 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 there'll be a lot of bluster. But he's actually a perfect gentleman. Um, he's also very competitive. The only time he gets uh, tough to handle here at Spendthrift is when he watches another stallion go to the breeding shed and he doesn't get to go. Um, so he's, he's very competitive. He's very intelligent. I think he's a very mentally tough horse. Um, and I think you see really good soundness. He's, you know, you don't always can, you know, put the terms consistent consistency and, and brilliance together. Uh, and I think that's what he does. He's sort of, he's, he's got that, that his offspring sort of have that lunch pail mentality, blue collar, show up to work every day, do their job. At the same time, um, many of them are, are quite brilliant. So I, I think those are what really helps him get so many good horses. I wanted to go back to, to Modern White Girl for a second, and not just her, but also Got Stormy. I thought it was, it was really cool that you guys pretty much right away said that you wanted to bring them back and race them in 2021. Obviously, there's a financial incentive to, to get that purse money next year. That's, that's more of an immediate return on investment than, than putting him in the breeding shed. But I have a seeing suspicion that you and Mr. Hughes also are racing fans and, and you want to see them on the track next year. Can you talk a little bit about that, about maybe your, your motivation for bringing them back as fans of the game? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, it's sort of a combination of all of those things. Um, yes, there's 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 a financial, maybe we can earn a little bit of that money back on the track, uh, but have a lot of fun and, ha- and and give the fans something something to watch. 
Um, yeah, yes, we are fans. And as long as these mayors are sound, I had a good conversation with Mark Cassie on, on, on Got Stormy, and he felt very, very comfortable that that um, she was very sound and, and well able to go on and have a good campaign. We'll always put the horses first. Um, but as, as long as they're sound and they're comfortable, you, you know, we had great, we had great luck with that with Beholder and, um, you know, almost made the decision a couple of times to retire her and went back and, and she rewarded us for us, for it. Uh, Richard did a great job of taking care of her. I have no doubt that uh, the guys we're using will do the same thing in, in, uh, in these instances, and we look forward to having a lot of fun. Hey, Ned, uh, people don't know this, or a lot of people may not know this about you, but you're anything but a Kentucky hard boot. <laughs> Western Massachusetts, of all things. And I understand we have something in common, an affinity for the Great Barrington Fair. So give us a little bit of your backstory, uh, you know, how you went from uh, Great Barrington, Massachusetts, to be an uh, operator, the guy running one of the most prestigious stud farms in Kentucky. <laughs> well, you, you know, maybe the Great Barrington Fair has a little bit to do with all that, but I was, I, uh, I grew up in Massachusetts in Great Barrington, and we looked forward to the fair every year. Um, I was, I think I was naive enough to think that the fair was there for entertainment, not just there so they could have horse racing. Um, but it just had great character. It was, it was so much fun. And it, it made the circuit around with Marshfield and Northampton. Um, and uh, I remember years later, they after it had been like dormant for about no, eight or 10 years, they revived it for one year and we just had a blast down there betting. I, I remember them pulling the blinkers off a horse one day and I thought, well, he looks sort of familiar. And, and I looked down in the program and he was by secretariat out of a Tom Rolfe mayor. That was sort of a long way from the Claiborne breeding shed to the Great Barrington Fair. But, uh, um, you know, you'd see some of those some of those kinds of horses in there sometimes. And of course, Carlos Figaro, who was the, the king of the fairs. And, and it, it was just it was just a great time. But, um, you know, I just was always um, enamored with horse racing, loved it. From, from, I don't, why? I, I can't tell you. I was one of those kids who talked my parents into getting a couple of horses that we knocked around on in our in our backyard, um, and just had this um, ha had a love for it from from an early age. Um, you know, my my father took me up to Saratoga. We happened to be there the day they inducted Secretary into the Hall of Fame. So I sort of got it in my blood early. Um, worked with horses some when I was very young. Actually, went, when I went to college, I actually had a roommate whose family was in the breeding business, a guy named Paul Manganero. Um, his, his uncle Anthony's in the business today. His father just passed away, but Paul's continuing on. And Paul would have these conversations with his father about um, about what stands they would be breeding to. And I remembered all these horses from, from their racing days. And, and it's just something that piqued my interest. And I began to see this as something that um, could possibly be a, a career. When I graduated from college, though, honestly, I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I took a job on a horse farm in New York State, uh, thought I would enjoy it while I looked for a quote-unquote real job, and uh, I enjoyed it so much. I think a year later, I threw everything I had in my truck and, and, and drove to Lexington and 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 started working here. Was was fortunate enough to get with some very good organizations. And, and one of the great things about the horse business in, in Lexington is – it's there's so many good horsemen in such a concentrated area. So many, you know, it's it, it's the mecca, and so you can you can. There's so much access to learning, and if you're willing to keep your eyes open and ask questions and and make a nuisance of yourself, you there's a there's an awful lot to 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 be learned right here, and uh, and so that's how I did it. But started at the bottom cleaning stalls and 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 worked my way up, and again fortunate enough to 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 have met a lot of the right people along the way. And, and um, I was actually a broodmare manager at Three Chimneys Farm, and that's sort of what I consider myself by trade. And, and Wayne Hughes was a client there. So I, I knew him for seven years before, um, before we came to Spendthrift. He actually asked me, oh, maybe as much as a year before uh, he bought Spendthrift. Um, that he was thinking about buying a farm and would I, would I come run it for him? And, and um, I, I never in a million years imagined it would be spendthrift, but um, uh, sure enough, it was, and, and here we are, so. I've got a tough question for you. You mentioned before about how some of these race fillies that you bought 
um, you know, you returned back to the trainers because you wanted them to compete and, and you're a fan of racing. Yet mm-hmm. Authentic, who is at the top of the game and probably is going to be horse of the year, you're retired. Um, yeah. So talk to us a little bit about, about that inconsistency, the race fillies you want to continue to run, but Authentic, <laughs> who, you know, would have you know, probably a really good four-year-old year, you retired to become a stallion. Yeah. Well, you're, you're talking about a little different price point. Um, and, you know, that was – we were wide open on terms of what we might do, but his racing career just went so well. And, and as Bob said, he's just, he's done so much. He's done everything that he really can. Um, and I think it was just time to get him to the breeding shed. And, and that's, that's our primary business is, is breeding. That's really what drives things here is, and really even more so than, than the mares and foals and yearlings it's the the stallion complex here is sort of the epicenter of spendthrift. And so that is our primary focus. And, you know, our, our, most everything that we do revolves around that. So, you know, that's such a central part of our business plan that we felt like it was a long debate. I I will tell you, we we've, there's been a lot of discussion about which way to go. Um, he's such a sound, talented horse. It was, it was very tempting to go on and and run next year. Um, and and I think if there was maybe a little, a little less uncertainty around some of the, uh, some of the, the big purses in terms of the Saudi cup and the Dubai world cup, you know, the, the, the decision might possibly have been different, but again, this is, this is such a central part of what we do. We felt like it was, it was time for him to come here and, and start his career. Just one thing, Ned, you've, you mentioned that you've been together with Mr. Hughes for going on 20 years or a little more. Mm-hmm. Um, to win a classic like the Kentucky Derby and then go on and win the Brewers Cup Classic, and it was great to see Mr. Hughes there in, in the winner's circle. Can you sort of uh, summarize um, what these accomplishments at this stage of his career, what they meant to him? Yeah, I, I, you know, obviously he was thrilled to do it. Um, I, I think especially having um, having this be by a son of Into Mischief. Into Mischief, again, as I said, we bought him at a two-year-old in training sale. Um, Into Mischief is actually named after after Mr. Hughes's son. Um, and, um, you know, so I think was, there was a lot of sentiment there. Um, but he's been in racing for so long. He and 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 for so many of the right reasons. He, even when he was running a, a a very successful business, he was a regular at Clocker's Corner at Santa Anita for so many years. Um, so he he enjoys this at at a very basic level um, and has for a very long time. And he's, you know, he he started with very inexpensive, you know, claiming type horses. Um, he's really, if anybody can sort of say they've seen it all, it's, it's probably him. And, and when he came to spend 50, he wasn't quite sure what the plan would be. He, he loved the idea of having a farm. Um, you know, he will tell you, this was, the idea was to have a place for his grandkids to come, um, uh, uh, you know, come out and play and, and have fun. But at the same time, we had this stallion complex and he wanted to, to, to make something of that. And, and so I think, you know, I think this is the culmination of all of his efforts. And and really, I think prior to owning Spendthrift, we bought it in 2004, I think racing was so much more of a hobby for him. And it was, it was not really a, a primary focus. And even though he would come into town and spend a fair amount of money on horses, um, I, I, it was still a little bit more of a distraction. Um, once he bought Spendthrift, and was beginning to ease out of the day to day of his other businesses, this really became his focus. And, and we've really watched him turn his, his business acumen towards the farm. And we've all learned so much working for him. So I I think for, um, you know, to have a, a, a leading stallion and, and a Derby and a, and a Breeders' Cup classic winner, um, is just, uh, you know, is got to be very gratifying for him because, you know, in 2004, um, he took a totally different approach. And, and, uh, I think this, this is a pretty clear indicator that it's been successful. 
Yeah, and I, I, have, I have one more for you, just as, as a fellow breeder. You know, everyone knows Into Mischief, Authentic, Malibu Moon, all the all the high ticket, you know, um, stallions that are out there. If you could recommend an undervalued stallion to somebody, um, to our listening audience, is there one or two stallions on the books where you would say that horse isn't getting the opportunity to be when I see his falls, it really looks like he's going to be the next, you know, top stallion? Can it, does it only have to be one or two? <laughs> That's all we got time for. <laughs> <laughs> we we have, you know, I think one of the things that Into Mischief showed us, and this is more than just a sales pitch, but it, it showed us that a, a good stallion can come from anywhere and oftentimes the place we least expect it. And, and, and a quick example, Notional was a horse that that came in with, with Into Mischief and um, breeders preferred him much more than, than into mischief and, and notional has, you know, now been sort of called from the roster and is standing instead in a regional market. So, um, but the horses that have really impressed me hit it a bomb, um, has gotten some really impressive, um, yearlings. Kenny McPeak paid, uh, 300 and I think it was 35,000, 340,000 for a yearling by hit it a bomb. That's essentially about a, a about a thirty five hundred dollar stud fee. So that'll give you an indication of how good looking um, his, his yearlings are. And it wasn't just the one horse. It was if you walked through our fields um, last winter, you you'd have said you would have thought hit it a bomb was the leading sire. Um, um, <clears throat> the uh, we just bought a uh, a free drop Billy weanling uh, out of the November sale that was as as good looking a. Uh, weanling, he was very late in the sale, so the price was a little bit less. We paid seventy-two thousand dollars for him, but again, um, a lower-end stud fee that we're really excited about. Um, so, so th- those are two that really jump out. Brody's cause as well, who's gotten runners um, this year and has showed promise. We we ran an ad a while back com- comparing his racing statistics, um, um, very much on a, a, a even par to to. Um, uh, the uh, other son of Giants Causeway, and I'm drawing a blank on his name now, standing over it uh, at um, uh, TaylorMade. But, uh, you know, he, he, um, he he's a horse who's really gotten it done on the racetrack, but has been, um, hasn't been as well received in the sale ring, but really, really solid individuals. So um, th- those are horses that have, have looked like sleepers right now. But uh, we've, got, we've got some others, but I, I guess I could go on all day with those. <laughs> No, we appreciate the insight. Thank you. For sure, man. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the time, Ned, and, and continued success. It's got to be a really exciting time to, to be at Spendthrift. It, it, it's, uh, it's been an honor to be here, and, um, and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll continue on with bigger and better things to come. Great. All right. Thanks, Ned. Hope to talk to you soon. Appreciate the time. Thank Thanks, Ned. Congratulations. Thank you, Ned. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Ned Toffee, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. The Green Group is widely recognized as the top-rated tax and accounting firm specializing in the horse business. Why do the top owners, breeders, pin hookers, and trainers trust The Green Group as their tax advisors? The difference is experience. Firm founder Len Green has over four decades of experience owning, breeding, and racing horses. First-hand knowledge gives Green Group clients proven tax and money-saving strategies. Visit The Green Group at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Remember, the Keeneland Digital Sale just announced will run December 15th. Entries open next Monday, November 23rd, and run through December 4th. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green, Alan Carrasso, our Green Group guest of the week, Ned Toffee, our producer, Patty Wolf, and our editors, Aliyah LaRocca and Tani Seifer. Thank you so much for watching. Wear a damn mask. See you next week.